Today's collect that we prayed at the beginning of the service, we said this, set us free, loving Father, from the bondage of our sins and in your goodness and mercy. Give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, it's a simple, but it's a profound prayer that acknowledges our condition and our dependence on God to change that condition. To ask God to set us free assumes that we are, by nature, not free, but, as the prayer says, held in bondage by our sins. Yet God is, as the prayer says, a loving Father who by His goodness and mercy can give us that liberty of that abundant life which Jesus Himself has made known. In many ways, it's a fundamental prayer for new life, for freedom, for union with God, and an acknowledgement that we are dependent upon God Himself if we are to know and experience this new life. I don't know about you, but I love movies that have surprising twists and turns. Cheryl and I especially like British detective shows. We are grateful for BritBox and the BBC. One of the satisfying things about these shows, at least to us, is not just the surprises, but the resolve. Eventually, we learn the truth. The, 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 initially, it starts out with the, the situation, the mystery is presented, and then we, we learn about the major characters in the situation what's happened, what the problem is, what the backgrounds are. And then slowly the detectives begin piecing together the larger picture and the truth becomes more apparent. And there are almost always surprises and revelations along the way, but at the end of the show we see the truth and we learn what really happened and why it really matters. Everything was leading to that point. And there's a similar process that happens throughout the Bible. There is an event, the fall, the entry of sin into the world. It has a catastrophic effect on creation, on the relationships between people, and most pointedly, on the relationship between humanity and God. The problem which is presented in Genesis 3 takes thousands of years to be resolved. That is, how can a people now caught in the bondage of sin be set free? How can the break in the relationship with God be made right again? And time and again, the people try to be better, to follow the laws, to be faithful, but their, and let's face it, our bondage always seems to get the better of us. How can people so unholy ever be restored to unity with a holy God? That's the question. And the collect speaks of the answer. It is God. God himself set us free, loving Father. Give us that liberty. We are appealing to him. And if we're going to be set free, if we're going to enjoy true liberty, it will be because he does something to bring it about. And the glorious news is that he does. In the lesson from Mark's gospel, which was just read, there is a line at the end that speaks directly to God's action. In verse 45 of Mark 10, the last verse of that passage, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That line, ransom for many, is key. A ransom is a payment made on behalf of someone else. When someone is held under ransom, they cannot pay it themselves. And usually a ransom is given in exchange for a person's freedom and liberty. Jesus is saying that he has come to give his life as a ransom. But what type? How? And for that answer, we're going to focus on Isaiah chapter 53 today. 
There's a lot of background we could talk about in terms of contextualizing Isaiah. It's a very magnificent, big book of a lot of themes and ideas, but here are a few that I want you to keep in mind this morning. We need to remember first that Isaiah is a prophet, and he is writing during a time of great loss and suffering for Israel. They are entering exile. They are losing their promised land. Their culture is collapsing. Their hope, the hopes and dreams of their forefathers seems a long way away. And as a prophet, throughout the book, Isaiah gives unflinching commentary on what has brought them to this place, to this point. And, and with the prophets, the and is always important, and Isaiah points them to the hope of redemption, return, and revival. And all seems lost, but in fact, all is not lost. God is still sovereign over all. Second, we need to understand that the people of Israel have bottomed out. There's nothing left in the tank. The needle is on empty. If there's going to be any hope, if there's going to be any future for them, it is going to have to come from outside of them. They are under no illusion that they are going to be able to do anything to adequately address their temporal or their spiritual situation. Any help, any solution is going to have to come from God. And thirdly, we need to remember that Isaiah wrote his prophecy a little over 700 years before Jesus. God's timeline is often much, much longer than we imagine. The ultimate hope that Isaiah predicts will come, but not immediately and not in the way people expect. But the clear message of Isaiah is that God will act. Our call, like Israel's, is to a resilient and even stubborn trust in our God, even when the light of hope is hard to see. Isaiah 50 verse 10 says, Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. The question is, what will God do? How will God set free his people, including us, hopelessly trapped in the bondage of their sins? Today's passage from Isaiah 53 is a part of the section of the book that refers to a series in this section that describes God's chosen servant, often called the suffering servant. And the New Testament Testament writers recognize the servant as Jesus. In fact, in Acts 8, You recall Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. The eunuch is leaving Jerusalem and Philip hears him reading what? Isaiah 53. And Philip goes to him and asks him, do you know what you're reading? He says, no, not really. Don't understand it. How can I unless somebody explains it to me? And so Philip gets in the chariot and tells him about Jesus using Isaiah 53. So the dots are not particularly hard to connect, and I think they teach us a great deal we need to remember. Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Notice the servant has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. You don't have to live long in this life to experience grief and sorrow. Some are small, some are large, and some positively knock us to the ground in despair. 
but none of them are without pain. All of them take their toll on us. The idea that time heals all wounds is simply not true, is it? Time may help, but scars may be covered over, but the scars remain. But this servant just doesn't empathize with us. He bears our grief, carries our pain. He takes them on himself. When we are hurting, when the pain and grief seems unbearable, our friends might be able to understand our pain, but only one actually takes it on himself. But he also deals decisively with our sin. He suffers on our behalf. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Ours. Later in verse 6, Isaiah says that all of us, by the way, without exception, have turned to our own way. And we hear echoes of this in Romans 3.23, where Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. All. But on this servant, our sins and iniquities are placed. And in those wonderful and startling words, we realize that with his wounds, we are healed. It's no surprise that in this we see the cross of Christ. And you hear this in the language of the Eucharistic prayer, which we'll pray in just a few moments where we will say, He, that is Jesus, made there on the cross by His one oblation of Himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. How can this be? It's because just as we inherited Adam's sin nature by his disobedience, so in Christ we inherit Jesus' victory over sin at the cross. Romans 5.19, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. And Isaiah prophesies this in verse 11, where he talks about those who will be accounted righteous. And that means not only to be declared righteous, but that we are able then to freely pursue righteousness. We are no longer held in bondage to our sins, incapable of anything else. Just as our nature apart from Christ was caught up in sin and disobedience, we are given a new nature by the servant of God, caught up in the pursuit of goodness, truth, beauty, righteousness, and faithfulness. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. In his excellent book, One with My Lord, Sam Albury talks about what Christ's ransom accomplishes in us. He says this, There has not just been a change in me, there has been a change of me. It is not just my life that is different, I am different. And Isaiah anticipates this in his prophecy. He says that the chastisement or suffering of this servant brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Peace, healing, and if we will dare to hope it, victory. The more we come to understand and accept what Christ, our suffering servant, has accomplished, the more we will begin to live the abundant life he promised. A few weeks ago, Bishop Frank was here to do confirmations, and I love it when Bishop Frank, I love it when both bishops come, I love it when Bishop Frank comes. Because he adds something to the end of the confirmation prayer. 
that is not in the prayer book. But this, it's a sort of extemporaneous thing that he does. The people that are being confirmed kneel in front of him. He prays the prayer of confirmation over them. And then he looks them straight in the eye. And he tells them, fight the good fight of the faith under the lordship of Christ. And remember, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. That is what we're talking about here. The prayer we prayed in today's collect has in many ways been answered. Our part is to live in joyful acceptance and faithfulness of this new reality. We will not always feel it. We may struggle to believe it. Sin will still fight within us. And griefs will still come to us, but these will not rule over us. We are new creatures in Christ. Your life and mine has been fundamentally changed. God has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. He has borne our griefs and sorrows. He has freed us. We are no longer bound, held in prison by our sins. We have been set free. Sin no longer has authority over us. And our identity itself is brought into union with Christ himself. So Jesus, our suffering servant, has paid the ransom. So live as free people. Live as free people. As Paul tells the Galatians, do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. You are free to live, free to love, free to serve, free to be the people God has created you to be. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Thanks be to God. Amen.